My name is Peter Baldwin. I'm with AMDG Architect. I wanted to welcome everybody. I, I always get to see friends and faces and people we know. So it's always kind of cool. This is a nice uh, digital community. Um, we've been doing the speaker series for many years. And uh, this is just kind of an opportunity for all of us to be exposed to um, an organization and typically an individual that um, we found has inspired us, has a great story to tell uh, with hopefully applications and implications and future growth on us as individuals and, and uh, et cetera. So I wanted to introduce today, uh, Kurt Verbeek. Um, Kurt is uh, one of the founders and leaders at ASJ, which is ACJ, uh, and it's a organization in Tegucigalpa, Honduras, that is um, fundamentally and solely committed to seeking more justice in that country and then uh, in even a broader global reach. Um, we've had the benefit as a firm to get to know ASJ. I've had the privilege of getting to know Kurt as a friend and um, Rather than give a deep bio, I mean, Kurt's done a lot of things and he's, um, um, you know, he has a PhD at Cornell. He has a whole bunch of things and attributes. He's a teacher and leader. Um, but I wanted to just list a few words that I thought um, were indicative of at least our experience of ASJ and Kurt. And I was thinking about these words in, this, in light of organizations and teams. And I was thinking, I would love to have a team that someone would say these things about. So I, I think ASJ is a super intelligent community. I think it's uh, an organization. I think it's creative. I think it's passionate and purposeful. I think it's uh, super strategic. I think it's courageous and brave and bold. And I think ultimately it's good. And I, I think it's full of goodness. And uh, so those are some of the words and obviously even the emotions that I feel when I think of Kurt and ASJ, I, I feel like it's been a tremendous, really privilege to come alongside, work with and support the organization and Kurt. Uh, I admire the organization and Kurt, I respect them. Uh, I actually love them. And uh, so I'm really pleased for those of you who maybe don't have as much exposure to ASJ uh, today that Kurt's gonna share some thoughts and works. There's a few logistics. This is about a, a half an hour presentation. And um, if you have questions and things, we'd encourage you to kind of put it in the chat. Um, and um, we'll just have definitely some time for questions and answer uh, questions and answers afterwards. Uh, if you have questions related to Kurt, um, we typically run this for about an hour. So we start to shut it down um, uh, around 1.30. And um, I think for those of you who do this more than once, we're moving towards thinking through um, kind of in the uh, vaccinated world of COVID, um, how we can kind of bring our speaker series back to our office. We're not sure when, but we're thinking that might be something we do in the fall. But we're gonna, either way, we're gonna try to create um, and do Zooms going forward anyway, so that we can kind of do a broader digital reach. Um, so I wanted to invite everybody or, or thank everybody for being here. I hope you feel welcome. And uh, I wanted to kind of turn it over at this point to Kurt. Thank you, Kurt. Uh, I think Andrea's getting the PowerPoint going. I see another screen at the moment. There we go. There we go. Perfect. Uh, yeah, so Peter almost made me cry, but he didn't. So that was good. We don't at least want to start out that way. Uh, it, it is an honor to be here uh, today. It's an honor to be able to share what ASJ is doing in Honduras, 
I purposely chose the title, Building a More Justice, More Just Society in Honduras. <clears throat> and in the next slide, you can see uh, a picture of the building that Peter and AMDG helped with. Uh, it's, it's a fabulous building. Uh, we inaugurated it in January and used it very well for two months and then COVID hit. So we have still been using it, but not much uh, over the last year and a half. But uh, Peter and the team was super helpful. Uh, Peter flew down several times, uh, had uh, workshops with our staff about what we needed, what sort of spaces we wanted. And uh, yes, I love Peter and uh, we love Peter. And some of you may want to need, need a little reminder of where Honduras is. Uh, geographically challenged, don't feel bad. So Honduras is in Central America, uh, part of what's called the Northern Triangle, right in the middle of Central America, between Mexico and South America. That's where we're going to be talking about today. And I want to shape my talk around three stories. Uh, I like stories. I think all of us connect with stories. And I'm gonna start with the hardest one first. And in 2001, we moved to a neighborhood called Nueva Suyapa, and we ended up finding out later it was the most violent neighborhood in Honduras at the time. You can switch the next slide, Andrea. Uh, we moved there in part because my best friend and co-founder of ASJ, Carlos Hernandez, had moved up there a couple of years earlier. And I came home one night and my daughter, Anna and my son, Noah, were crying. Uh, the father of one of their classmates had been killed that morning. And I went over to talk to Carlos and he told me it was true and that their father had sold vegetables out of an old pickup truck. He was a peddler. And he was leaving at about 4 a.m. to buy some more. Uh, three men in ski masks took his money and then really for no reason uh, shot him and killed him. So I went back home, I calmed down my kids, uh, prayed with them and, and didn't think a lot more about it, honestly. Uh, this wasn't so uncommon in my neighborhood. But three days later, his widow came to Carlos, who was the principal of our kids' school, and said that she knew who did it. She had two witnesses, they were neighbors of ours, they lived a few blocks away, and they were willing to testify. So if you're in Grand Rapids or Boston or, or somewhere in the US, what would you do? You have witnesses to a homicide, you would probably go to the police, uh, explain what would happen and expect them to very quickly be arrested. But if you're in Honduras and, and if we would have gone to the police, they might go and arrest them, but we didn't know if one of them could be a bad cop and he might go and tell the bad guys who we were and, and they may show up at our doorstep or at the widow's doorstep. So we started out trying to find police officers that we could trust and we started calling friends and acquaintances and in, it wasn't easy and a couple of months went by and then the three bad guys ended up shooting an off-duty cop and some other cops saw that and they chased them and in the end one was killed and, and two of them were arrested. And a few days later, Carlos and I were sitting in my living room uh, drinking tea. And I said, you know, these guys were really bad. I knew that they had killed X, Y, and Z around by my church. And Carlos said, he didn't even know about X, Y, and Z, but he knew about A, B, and C near his church. And so we did a little bit of research and we ended up finding out that after we knew who they were, after we had witnesses willing to testify, they had killed 13 more men and, and we had not stopped them. And you might ask like, how is that possible, right? How, how could we do that? And, and I know it was a little bit of fear, uh, but honestly, I'm not a very fearful person. I think the biggest problem is that we just didn't know who we could trust, who was gonna protect us, but especially who was gonna protect the witness and the widow. And it was a police and justice system that had been corrupted. It was even a source of the violence. So as, as Peter said, I have a PhD, I have connections, I have money, I have experience, and I didn't know what to do. So how were my poor, vulnerable neighbors supposed to know what to do? 
and, and I don't think that I'm an exception. Uh, my poor neighbors, like poor and vulnerable people around the world, are suffering and dying because the police and justice systems that are supposed to protect them don't, and sometimes are even the source of the violence. But we are largely not fixing that, and we're not largely even talking about it. So this sort of violence and corruption, systemic injustice, not just killing people, is hurting my neighbors and poor around the world in all sorts of ways. A neighbor of ours started a small business uh, making pillows, but had to shut it down a few months later because the gang showed up and was taking all of their profit and threatened if the, she didn't keep paying, they were gonna burn down her house. We know teenage girls who don't go to school because of threats of sexual violence. We have neighbors who don't go to church at night because they're afraid to walk home after dark. So, so violence is hurting the poor, not just murders, but all sorts of ways. And this sort of violence and broken security systems don't seem to be on the agenda of, of our own agenda, but also of the organization, organizations that we support. Maybe look at the websites of organizations that you're supporting, maybe World Vision or Compassion. And lots of these organizations will say they're helping the poor start businesses. Uh, but they're not helping those people figure out how to stop the gang from stealing the profits from that business. And if you're a member of a church, see if any of your churches are working on violence in their neighborhoods or in your city's neighborhoods, or if they're supporting missionaries that are working on helping the people in those countries deal with violence. And I went to a prestigious university. I studied poverty and development. I don't. I, there wasn't a single class on violence. I don't remember actually any class, even though I was studying poverty and development, we didn't talk about violence and its effect on the poor. So again, why aren't we talking about this? And again, and I, don't, I don't know. Uh, I think part of it is fear, but I think it's more than that. I think that we have purposely left violence and justice off the, off the agenda. Um, and, and I think in part, we have become convinced that, that all of this is, is too complicated. It's too hard, it's too political, it'll take too long, it's too controversial, and probably that it's too dangerous. And I think we need to ask ourselves who benefits if we believe that this is too hard, too complicated, that violence and corruption are off the agenda for us helping the poor. And I think in the end, it's, it's criminals, it's the corrupt who are very happy if we believe that because they will be able to keep doing the things that they're doing. So what do we do instead of trying to address that violence and injustice? Uh, usually what we do, development organizations do, churches do, is we create parallel systems. So the public hospital isn't working, we'll build a private hospital. Or the public schools aren't working, we'll build private schools, we'll build orphanages. And we often say that, you know, this would be easier than fixing the system. Uh, I'm not convinced it is. And you can just imagine, it, it, there's nothing easy about starting and funding and keeping running a, a whole private hospital or an orphanage or a, or a private school. So I think we need to rethink what justice is. And, and as a Christian organization, at least part of that is putting that in a biblical context. So we do know that God cares a lot about justice. There are 1,379 times the word justice is mentioned in Old and New Testament. It's men justice is mentioned twice as often as love, uh, which surprises lots of people. I, I, I think maybe God thought we needed to hear that twice as many times as the message of love. And I, I just included a couple of texts. Uh, Amos is great for this. Uh, this verse, Amos 2, 6 and 7, God says, I will not relent. They sell the innocent for silver and the needy for a pair of sandals. And who is Amos talking to? He's talking to the elite of his society. And he's, he's condemning them for the way they are treating the poor. Matthew 23, 27, woe to you teachers of the law and Pharisees, you are like whitewashed tombs, you snake, you brood of vipers, you, how will you escape being condemned to hell? 
again, who is Jesus speaking here to? He's speaking to the religious authorities, the, the priests, the pastors. And, and I know my mom, my mom taught me not to talk like this, uh, not to use that sort of language. So we can see that Jesus and the prophets were passionate about justice. And we have to ask ourselves, like, have, have we watered down what justice is? Uh, are, are we doing justice as Jesus and God has called us? So what is justice? And there's a, a famous Chinese proverb that I think helps. Uh, just a couple months ago, I spoke to a Chinese church in Boston, and I was afraid that this really wasn't a Chinese proverb, and I, everybody just made this up, but they confirmed that, yes, it is. It's a very famous Chinese proverb, even in China, that if you give someone a fish, they will eat for a day, and we often call that charity, uh, giving something to someone in need. It's, it's often very necessary, so after a tornado, after a hurricane, the, the condo building that flew down and fell down in Florida, you know, people need a place to sleep, they need food, they need water, they need clothing. But then we go on and say, but it, it's better yet to teach someone to fish because then they can eat for a lifetime. We often call this development. Uh, and, and it assumes that the poor don't know something that, that we or others do. Uh, and again, that's often appropriate. We, we may have some better farming technique, some better fishing technique. Uh, and, and so that's charity development, but what about justice? Um, so what if we teach them how to fish? We get them a, a, a boat and some poles, but then the gang comes along and steals their boat and poles, or maybe a corrupt, mayor or corrupt police misuses their power and they fence in the lake. A public lake becomes a private lake and they can't fish there anymore. The, the Chinese church also told me that they talk about this with corruption and that the authorities end up coming in and muddying the water. They make the water so uh, dirty that that's corruption, that, that people can't fish there anymore. So there are all sorts of ways that we can try to help the poor, but that uh, violence or corruption can get in the way. So I define, not just me, lots of people define injustice as individuals or groups misusing their power to take someone else's life, liberty, dignity, or the fruits of their love and labor. So then justice work, I think, is best defined as fighting injustice that the poor have a right to fish, they have a right to their boats. And it's our responsibility to restore those rights. And in my shorthand for justice work, it's, it's work that's gonna make someone mad because it's about power. Uh, someone is abusing their power to take someone else's stuff. And if we stop them from abusing that power, they're going to get mad they're, because they have been, they've been taking advantage of others and they don't wanna stop. So then if someone doesn't get mad, I think it's probably not justice work. So when my neighbor was killed, we could have done several things. We could have done charity. We could have given the widow some food and grief counseling. We could have done development. We could have helped her start a tortilla business. But no one would have gotten mad. And even though those are good things, that's not what we did. Uh, what we decided to do was to help get the bad guys caught to help them get put in jail. And we knew that people were gonna get mad, but we also knew that we would be able to save lives. And for me, that's justice work. It's, it's stopping the criminals, the corrupt from abusing their power. So here's what we did. Carlos, did not, Carlos and I didn't understand the problem very well, but we promised each other that we were going to figure it out and that we were gonna do something. And here's what we did. We ended up hiring three staff people an investigator, a lawyer, and a psychologist. So the investigator was an ex-cop. So what does an ex-cop know that we didn't know? Well, ex-cop knows a lot of things we didn't know. But the thing that was important is that they know who the bad cops were and who the good cops were. And they made sure that all of our cases went to good cops. Then we hired a lawyer who was an ex-prosecutor. And, and again, the lawyer knew the same thing. They knew who were the good prosecutors and bad prosecutors were. And so we brought together our witnesses 
with the police that we could trust and the prosecutors we could trust. And we already knew that our neighbors didn't trust the police and we didn't trust the police. But we also found out the police also didn't trust our neighbors. And let me explain that real quickly. So maybe think about it like this. The police also has a family and the police's job is to go into a house where they know there are three gang members who have guns and who are gonna try and kill them when they go in. They have to knock down the door, they have to go inside and arrest them. So they are risking their lives to do that. But then they have to think about how likely is it that we do that, we will risk our lives. And then the victims need to show up in 48 hours to pick these gang members out of a line. And then they need to show up again in six months for the pretrial. They need to show up 18 months later for the trial. And if the victims don't show up for any of those appointments, the bad guys will go free. So the police are always calculating how likely is it that the witnesses will show up? And, and do I wanna risk my life for that? If I'm gonna know that these bad guys are gonna go free. So we also needed to convince the, the victims to trust the police, but we needed to convince the police they had to trust the victims. We need to build bridges of trust to restore this broken system, this broken justice system. So what happened? Here's a graph, it, it worked. Violence went down, way down. In 2005, in our neighborhood, we had 42 homicides. Last year, we had seven. And as you can see, it, it's gone up and down, but never nearly as high as it was. We've saved over 600 lives in the last 15 years. Our program is now in 10 more neighborhoods. We confronted those abusing power. They got mad, but we have saved lives. We have done justice. And it didn't take too long, really in four years. It wasn't too hard. We did it with three staff people. And in the end, it wasn't too dangerous or too complicated. So let me go to my second story about sort of taking this to the national level. The woman in this next picture is, her name is Julieta Castellanos, and she is president of the national, she was president of the Honduran National University, which has 80,000 students. So it's a big university. October 11, her 19 year old son here in the photo was on his way home from a birthday party. Eight on duty police officers, these police officers were in uniforms, they were in police cars, stopped him and then told him that they were gonna steal his car. He got scared and he put the car in gear and, and hit the gas and ran off. Uh, they, they ran after him, they, they got in their cars, chased him, they started shooting at his car and they ended up shooting him through the abdomen. Once he was stopped, uh, his friend who was with him was, was unhurt. He told them, you know, you don't know who I am. My mother is the president of the National University. And, and he did that thinking this was gonna keep him safe. Like when they knew who they were, they were gonna be, you know, let's get you to the hospital and get you fixed up. But instead they called their bosses and they said, we were trying to steal this car. Uh, we chased them, we shot them, and it ends up, it's, it's Julieta's son, what should we do? And their bosses told them, take them outside of town, throw them in a ditch, and shoot them both in the back of the head. And that's what they did. So what would be the typical response in, in Grand Rapids or Honduras everywhere? Like, you know, you visit the, the, we, the grieving mother, maybe have a prayer service, you raise money to help cover her expenses. But what would justice do? So based on our experience in Nueva Suyapa, we helped the police investigate. And we ended up figuring out it was cops and we helped get them arrested. We helped getting them convicted. And as we were doing justice, Julieta said, you know, I am, I am one grieving mother who is getting justice, but there are thousands of other mothers in Honduras who don't have justice. And she helped us form 
what we called the Alliance for Peace and Justice in 2012. And we ended up bringing together the Catholic Church and the Protestant Church, and, and just that's pretty amazing. They usually don't work very well together, and World Vision and a bunch of other organizations. And we started pushing more than anything to get rid of the bad cops, cops who are involved in stealing cars and murders and drug trafficking. And we learned that the problem wasn't just bad cops. And, and I'll just give you one example. In 2012, San Pedro Sula, it's a city of a million people in Honduras. They had 30 homicides a week, but they only had 22 homicide investigators. So each investigator was getting an, an, a case and a half new each week. And they only had two pickup trucks that those 22 investigators had to share. So it wasn't just bad cops. We needed better cops, but we also needed more cops. We needed more vehicles. And we ended up developing a proposal to pressure to uh, have, we had press conferences. We met with the media. We met with the president of Honduras 19 times just that year. And what happened? Over the next seven years, homicides dropped 40%. And we have still a long way to go, but 7 million Hondurans now feel safer. We confronted those abusing power, the drug traffickers, the corrupt cops. We did justice, people got mad, but it didn't take so long. It took three years. It wasn't so hard or so complicated. Let me end now with the third story, uh, purging the police. So in 2012, Honduras had the highest homicide rate in the world. Killing of Julieta Sun was just one of those murders. And our number one demand of the police was purging the police. The government had made three attempts already and it had failed. And in 2016, the president decided to name a commission. You can go to the next slide, Andrea. Uh, there's the high homicide rate. Uh, the highest in the world, and you can see where the U.S. is by comparison. 2016, the president decided to name a commission, and four of those six members were, uh, were ASJ members. You can go to the next slide, uh, Andrea. So what would justice do? The president invited ASJ to be a member of purging this police commission, and we ended up saying yes. It was a seven-member commission. And we had four of the seven, we had a majority. Two of them were staff and two of them were board members. So what happened? Over the next two years, we evaluated 14,000 cops. We ended up removing over 6,000 of them, including 40% of the high ranking officers. All of the generals were removed and we didn't stop there. We have already hired 7,000, now almost 8,000 new cops. And we hope to double the police force with good cops in the next few years. And what happened? Here's a graph of the homicide rate from 2005 to 2012. You can see how it peaked in 2012. And, and in seven years, we have brought it down lower than it was in 2005. Thousands of lives have been saved. Trust in the police is growing. And, and this is just so exciting. I feel so grateful to be a part of ASJ, to be a part of these changes. Today, I've just told you about three stories, how God is using ASJ to make my neighborhood safer, making Honduras safer, huge improvements in the quantity and quality of the police force. And if I had time, I could tell you about a bunch of other stories. Uh, and we can do some of that in the question and answers, how we've gotten more medicines in the hospitals, how we've decreased drug trafficking, how we're getting police and economic elites indicted for corruption or going to jail. Right now, how we're helping get vaccines to Honduras and getting Hondurans vaccinated. 2012, Honduras said that the US and the UN said Honduras was on the verge of being a failed state, that violence and drug trafficking were out of control, that education was a mess, corruption was rampant. In 2021, there is still a lot of stuff to do, but the trends that are changing, there's, there's reason for hope. And we have had a privilege of being a part of that. 
So I want to end with four lessons. There's the slide with the first. Um, oh, just go back, Andrea, to the previous one. First of all, what is justice? So not everything we do uh, as an organization, as churches, is justice. The food pantry, the job training, water in Africa, those are all good things. I don't think those are justice work. Justice is about stopping bad people from misusing, from abusing their power, and someone will get mad. Uh, so we need to see that justice is bigger than a lot of these hot topics, uh, that many of the poor are suffering from injustice in education, in healthcare, and that millions are living in fear of dying from violence that goes unchecked by broken and corrupt systems. And what are we doing about that? Second, uh, injustice is not just in Honduras and, and probably don't need to tell you that nowadays, but the US has justice problems. The US has a violence problem. Four of the most, four of the 40 most violent cities are in the United States, St. Louis, Detroit, New Orleans, and Baltimore. There is not another rich country city in that list. There's not a single European, Japanese, there, it, only the US is a rich country and we have four cities on there. That, that's crazy to me. So not just Honduras is suffering from violence, not just the poor in Honduras. And there's distrust of the police in Honduras, but also in Ferguson, in Cleveland, in Chicago, in Grand Rapids. And I bet in all of those cities, the police also don't trust the neighbors, just like in Honduras. And, and I think that is, <laughs> That is super exciting because that means that the US could maybe learn something from Honduras and what we're doing in Honduras. And that just feels right. Uh, when I talk about poverty and development, it's always that Honduras needs to learn something from the US, from rich countries. But when we talk about justice, it's much less an us them. And it's exciting to see that the US could learn from what Honduras is doing in justice and violence. Third, uh, we need to stop listening to our culture's lie that our safety and our comfort should be our top priority. And here I wanna credit a friend, Joel Hammernick. It's clear from Jesus, the apostles, the prophets, their number one priority was following God's call wherever that led to do justice, to heal brokenness, and that that would often involve risk. It would often involve making people mad. But our culture says, even our Christian culture says that, yeah, God would be really happy if we moved into the city in Chicago or Grand Rapids, if we started working with violence or, or helping heal brokenness. But, but that sounds dangerous. Somebody's gonna get mad and, and then, they often throw sort of this, I would call it the killer question. Like, you know, I might be willing, but is that okay to do to my kids? I can't put them at risk. Like, where would they go to school? So I'm not suggesting we be stupid, but I think that we are being called to heal brokenness. And God is calling us one way or another to go into these broken places where violence and corruption have taken hold. And we can show our culture, we can show our churches, we can show our children that God's call is more important than maximizing our comfort or minimizing our risk. And finally, we need to stop believing the lie that doing justice, that changing systems, that stopping corruption and violence is too hard, it's too complicated, it's gonna to take too long, it's too political, it's too polarizing. That's exactly what the corrupt and the criminals want us to believe. And we need to stop just creating parallel systems that are not actually fixing where the vast majority of the poor and marginalized are, are going to have to go. We have seen results in three or four years, and it's not always gonna work that way but God is calling us to act justly. God has promised to be on our side. So the question for all of us today is, are, are, we, are we willing to act justly? Are we willing to fight 
for justice. So I would ask for your support for ASJ, for the work that we're doing in Honduras. But I also wanna challenge all of you to start talking, to start thinking, to start doing justice where you live, in Grand Rapids, in San Francisco, and especially thinking about violence and broken justice systems. Who is abusing a power around you in your city? Who is being hurt? And what can we do to bring justice there? So I wanna close. Uh, thank you again for this honor, for being able to share what we're doing in Honduras. If you wanna know more about ASJ, there's our website, but uh, I'm also sharing here a picture of the atrium of our new building uh, that Peter and some of you helped design. I, I love that atrium. Uh, it it's inviting people in. Uh, to, to share, to, it's, it's, it's filled with light and beauty. And, and once again, I wanna thank Peter and AMG for all their support for ASJ and for Honduras. And thank you for this opportunity. And I think now it's questions and answers. So you guys, um, Andrea, I don't know if there's any chats because I didn't look. Um, yeah, if there are, maybe you could lead this and, and then obviously um, just interested if anybody, people have any questions. Looks like there's a question from Kate. Um, she says, Kurt, are you involved with Gary Hogan's IJM at all? I'm currently reading the Locust Effects which is devastating to read, but a different perspective on the poverty question as you've talked about today. Uh, great question, great book. Um, maybe somebody can put a link to that book like on Amazon in the chat. Um, and that also makes me think uh, Nick Waltersdorf, some of you may know him. He was uh, a philosopher, probably one of the great American philosophers. Uh, he was at Kelvin for a while, uh, Notre Dame, Yale, Oxford. Uh, he and I wrote a book together uh, that some of you also might be interested in. So uh, yeah, there's a couple of books that you can learn more about this. Gary Haugen's book is great also on, on violence in the poor. So Gary and I jam were one of our, we started the same year actually, uh, ASJ and I jam. Um, and Gary and IGM were one of our first uh, donors supporting organizations. They don't anymore, but we still have a, a fairly close relationship. And they also are doing some really great work, uh, probably quite different. So they work in a whole bunch of countries. I have no idea how many, I'm guessing 30 or 40 on two issues, uh, sex trafficking and uh, especially child slavery, but slavery of all sorts. And, and so they have picked to work those two justice topics in a whole bunch of countries. And we've kind of done the opposite. We've picked one country and tried to go deep into all of the justice issues or maybe not all of the main justice issues. Uh, so we focus on violence uh, and injustice in education, health and the justice system in general. So uh, yeah, so good question. I think in the chat now is a link to our book and a link to the to Gary's book. Um, so just to let you guys know, if you do have any questions, feel free to unmute yourself and ask that way, or I'm happy to read in the chat. Doesn't look like there's another one yet, so we'll just wait a few minutes. We're patient, right, Andrea? I've noticed as a professor, sometimes you just gotta give people a minute to think. Um, I, um, I'm struck by your use of the word trust and lack of trust from both sides. 
Um, and I'm just curious how you found it works to build that because it's got to happen both ways at the same time. And, um, you know, just how do you make that happen? Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, a, a few things about that. So, you know, the I, I still think that trust is key uh, to democracy. Maybe we could even talk about it right now. It's key to this whole idea of vaccinations in the US. Like I think if you talk about people who are getting vaccinated and people who aren't, uh, trust will come up right away. That people who aren't vaccinated don't trust uh, the authorities, the vaccine, the way that it was developed. So I, I think trust is key to this whole idea of democracy, of, of trusting our authorities, but in the justice system and in the police, it's especially key because uh, it's life and death often uh, on, on all sides. So what we ended up figuring out with our peace and justice project is we could jumpstart this process. So by hiring an ex-cop, they could right away put us in connection with police who were trustworthy. So we didn't have to go through a long process there. When we were then working in the community and we had victims, often people who had been the victims of murder, they were wanting help. They were in some of their hardest moments, but they didn't know who they could trust. So we could put those people together. And then uh, the police ended up finding out fairly quickly that we were able through the, the built trust that we had built up with these community members to also make sure that they would show up for their, for their trial dates, for their interviews. And once we had done that once or twice, we could build on that so that we could bring a new victim to another victim in the neighborhood and they could tell their story. Like we testified and nothing happened. In fact, the, the pe nothing happened. Nothing happened to me we weren't victimized again, but the person was caught and they've gone to jail and now, and now they're going to trial. And then the police would also see, well, those victims showed up in one case, in two cases, in three cases. We also found that oftentimes the victims initially would, would not trust the police or even ASJ. They would trust the person that they had contacted. But as things developed, they would, they grew it to start to trust more and more, at least, never great uh, levels, trust the institution. So a new person showed up for ASJ and they had enough trust to keep going, even though this was a new person, but they were also from ASJ. A new cop would show up on their case. And at first they'd be fearful, but then they would keep going forward. And I think that that's also an interesting insight for how we build trust in the United States, around vaccines, around the police, in Chicago and inner city Grand Rapids. We need to give people reasons to trust, like successful experiences, at least a couple, with things working the way they're supposed to be. They will then trust those people and then they will transfer that trust, at least somewhat slowly, to the institutions in general. So I think, in Honduras, like building a good justice system is a is going to be very incremental in building trust in you know case by case with people, but it spreads relatively quickly, and I think that also shows us some insights about how to do that with the police in the U.S., but also around other issues that have us polarized, like politics, vaccines, etc. Maybe I went further than you wanted with that, Tom, but there you go. Okay, it looks like we have another one in the chat um, from Maria. I am a Honduran myself, and I am also deeply grateful for all the work ASJ is doing in my country. I currently live in the USA and would like to know if there are 
ways we could contribute to your work from our home. I would also appreciate hearing about the work you are doing to ensure free and fair elections. May God bless you. Uh, thanks, Maria. Um, yeah, so again, all of you, you can uh, go to the website uh, or email Andrea or Peter if you work there in the office and they can share my email or uh, WhatsApp or whatever you guys use for your easiest way to track down information about how to uh, support us financially, prayers, volunteer. Uh, the elections is a good question. I'll just jump on that for a minute or two. So Honduras had elections uh, four years ago. We're in the last, the eighth year of a president who was reelected under very messy, questionable circumstances. And it, uh, we are quite nervous and the country in general is that there will be violence, uh, potentially fraud again in these elections. There are seven candidates. Honduras doesn't have a second round. So it's whoever gets the highest percentage wins. So with seven candidates, uh, probably the winning candidate will end up with about 30 some percent of the vote and they will be elected president. So just that shows you how uh, dangerous it is. 70% of the people in the country will have voted for someone else and yet the presidential candidate with 30% will win. Uh, so we have been working for the whole last four years. We had a, a, a document, we had a lot of support from a bunch of different organizations, the Catholic Church, Protestant Church, World Vision, et cetera, trying to implement these changes. We had nine specific proposals. One was for a second round. A second round would be that the top two vote getters would go to a second round so that you would make sure whoever was president got at least 50% of the vote, uh, but that has not been accepted. Um, we ended up getting about three or four of our nine proposals fully or at least partially uh, approved. But we're also working very hard now in the next, we're about six months out from the election. Uh, we have a bunch of young people in Honduras organized. We're gonna have election monitors. We're gonna have a website, which we're keeping track of things. Uh, we are still trying to get some of the changes fully implemented. So it's, it's a great topic, uh, probably more details than, than I can go in for here or that the rest of the group would be interested, but I'd be happy, Maria, to, to send you more info or, or to connect you with some of the people at ASJ who are working specifically on this. So we have three people working almost full-time on this issue. Anybody else? I'll give you a couple minutes. I'm contrary to Kurt, who is a professor and a very patient person. I am not a professor and I have been clearly diagnosed as being one of the most impatient people in the world. So, um, but I, did, I didn't want to uh, prolong this. I, I wanted to thank you, Kurt. Um, and every time I hear you speak, it, it, it is challenging because it's, uh, and if it's not challenging, then there's probably something wrong um, with us if we're not challenged by what you say and particularly in our own context, not just globally and in other places, but in our own day-to-day -day lives and how we connect and interconnect, intersect with our communities and our um, work and our families and beyond. So, um, Really appreciate your taking the time and just sharing three stories. Uh, there are so many other ones. I know one of the ones you didn't reference was the amazing work you've been doing in the schools and the injustice of uh, the learners there and all of that. I just, that struck me so much when you told me that. Um, but it goes on and on. And there is 
there's a lot of overlaps to our country, like you were talking about, whether it's healthcare or education or violence and et cetera, et cetera. So, and, and in our lives. So thank you for challenging us. Thank you for being an example. I was struck by your aunt, uh, how you answered Tom, how it was all around. Uh, it was strategic. It was also around relationship. It started small. It was about actions and not words. And then it grew into potential institutional or bigger things. And I, I just think that's um, so aligned with you and your organization. And, um, and I, I just appreciated that answer because it, it just resonated with, I guess, my experience of everything that ASJ is and you are. And some of the things that um, some of us, other human beings oftentimes fall short on, or we think big and try to act big uh, and then we fail or, or we forget relationships and we, we stop, we don't always do the steps. So I just thought there was great wisdom in that response. And, and also um, it was based on results, not just theoretical ideas, which um, I have great respect for. So. For a lot of reasons, I uh, just want to thank you. And um, I think we're going to sign off unless someone wants to kind of pop in. I'm going to count to five and then we're going to say goodbye. One, two, three, four, five. So thank you, Kurt. And thank you, everybody, thank you. for being on. Take thank care. everyone. Thanks.